Good evening, Baker Institute Student Forum members, Rice University staff, faculty, and honored guests. I welcome you to the Baker Institute today. My name is Rahini Sigaretti, and I'm a junior at Weiss College. I'm part of the Baker Institute Student Forum leadership team. I'm studying chemistry, anthropology, and policy studies. I welcome you today. I'm honored to introduce our guest, Lady Ashton Catherine of Apollant. Her titles include numerous appointments. She's the High Representative of the Union for Foreign Affairs and Security Policy. Lady Lady Ashton is a British labor politician who assumed this position in 2009. Previously, Lady Ashton has served in, in the Department of Education and Skills and Department of Constitutional Affairs and Ministry of Justice. Lady Ashton was awarded a bachelor's degree in sociology from Bedford College and an honorary degree from the University of East London. Accompanying Lady Ashton in her speech will be Ambassador Edward Regian, the founding director of the Baker Institute, who is formerly the US ambassador to Israel and Syria. Before we begin, I'd like to inform you of a little bit about the Baker Institute Student Forum. Our current president is Danny Cohen, seated right here. And this year, I am very excited to announce, I think for the first time at the Baker Institute, that we will be hosting the first annual Baker Institute Undergraduate Public Policy Conference this September, September 20th and 21st, and our topic will be healthcare. So without any other wait, I'd like to introduce the ambassador and Lady Ashton. Thank you. Well, first we want to warmly welcome you, Lady Ashton, uh, you. to the Baker Institute Student Forum at the Rice University and to the uh, Baker Institute. Uh, you, your reputation precedes you. You have probably one of the most difficult jobs in the foreign policy field in the world. And uh, the role of the uh, European Union in foreign policy is vast and very important. And I have to ask you one question at the beginning. Henry Kissinger uh, famously stated at one point when he was Secretary of State, he said, I'd love to conduct US foreign policy with Europe, but who do I call? Who is the Secretary of State of Europe? Who is the Foreign Minister of Europe? And now, with your <laughs> nomination as the, uh, the Secretary of State, if we can put it that way, of Europe, how would you respond to Henry Kissinger? <laughs> Well, I'd respond in two ways. First, my dear belated friend, Richard Holbrook, used to ring me up and go, is that Europe? <laughs> <laughs> and then when we started this uh, great adventure of trying to design a new strategy for the European foreign policy, it was put to me like this. If you can imagine the scene, Secretary then Clinton, Hillary, would go into President Obama and say, Mr. President, good news. We now have one phone number for Europe, instead of all these different countries. And the president would say, Hillary, that's fantastic news. Why don't we call her up? Let's see what she says. And they would ring my phone and they would get my voicemail. And the voicemail would say, welcome to Europe. For the French position, press one. For the German position, press <laughs> one. <laughs> <laughs> I hope you've told Henry Kissinger that. <laughs> <laughs> Lady Ashton, uh, it would be terrific for us to hear what you consider some of the highest priorities you have in a foreign policy field now, in this position you have. If you had to explain to us maybe two or three of your top priorities in the current environment. Well, high on my list would be the relationship with the United States. We are your most reliable partner, and I intend to keep it that way. By that I mean we share the same values and the same aspirations, democracy, human rights, the rule of law, peace and security for our citizens. And to that end, we need to work together and stand together 
when trying to deal with all of the challenges that confront us increasingly in what I call real time, minute by minute, day by day. But for the European Union to really develop that partnership, I think we need to get better at our neighbourhood. Traditionally, you know, we've relied on you. The United States was a big reason why the European Union came together, because from the ruins of the Second World War, you understood that it was vital to create mechanisms that could make sure that war would never come back. In Europe, we were very, very good at fighting each other. The British and the French have been doing it for about a thousand years, not very successfully, as you may have noticed. But it was very, very crucial to have the US engagement. And you've continued with that in helping us develop our strategies, especially in the Western Balkans, Serbia, Kosovo, Sarajevo with Bosnia Herzegovina, with all of the ways in which we've tried to develop Europe. You have stood with us. But we need to start standing on our own. And I say this very openly when I meet with uh, State Department or with the White House, is in a way you'll judge that Europe has grown up when we're able to lead in our own neighbourhood really effectively. So my second big priority would be our neighbourhood. How do we engage effectively east and south? Especially true when you think about the events in Egypt, Tunisia, Libya and of course Syria. But with the Middle East peace process, an area that Ambassador you know very well. Well we have a particular role to play, it's not the same as your role, it's different, it's complementary. We're not you, but we should be able to really engage and really support countries in transition because most of the countries of the European Union have only just ended their own transitions. And then my third big uh, sort of strategic question is about the relationships we need to build with others. My proposition would be that there's very little you can now do in the world on your own. You have to do most of it in partnership with someone, either EU, US, or with the United Nations, with the Africa Union, the Arab League, or collaborating with others. I lead the talks with Iran on their nuclear program. We do that with what we call the E3 plus 3, what you call the P5 plus 1. It's still 6. <laughs> the French, the British, the Germans, the Chinese, the Russians, and of course the United States, with me as the negotiator leading with those political directors. You do it in partnership. And therefore, strategic partnerships for us with you, but also with Russia, with China, with Japan, with Brazil, with India, South Africa. These are critical relationships that will become even more important, especially as in the case of India, Brazil, and South Africa, they feel their own strength and their own weight in the world. As they grow and develop, they become really important. So those are the things that I believe in. This partnership, critical, vital to us. Our neighbourhood and how we operate. And then building those partnerships are going to help us tackle the problems that affect our citizens. Uh, you've been very eloquent uh, on the major theme that you've uh, alluded to on sustain sustainable development in transitional societies. Uh, the world is rapidly changing before our eyes, especially in terms of the Arab awakening or the Arab Spring, which we've defined as a tectonic shift in the political landscape of the broader Middle East. Yet, we don't seem to be able to get it right in the West in how to respond to these uh, forces of transition. Uh, basically, for example, uh, uh, nation building, the issue of nation building. And is it a bridge too far for the West to actually have the pretense of nation building? Or what would your wise wisdom be to how we should approach transitional change? Well, I don't think we build the nations. I think we help them build their own nations. Right. And I think we have a huge amount to offer. But whenever I visit Egypt or Libya or Tunisia, particularly, or any country going through transition, Burma is another example of a country going through dramatic and actually quite amazing transition. My first comment to everyone is it's your country. It belongs to you and 
you need to build it and it won't look the same as mine or any of the 27 that I know very well. It will look different and we will support you. But what we ask of you is that you build a country that carries the same values that we do, that believes in what I've called deep democracy, not just one election, but the prospect of many more to follow. Democracy is about throwing governments out as well as electing them. It's about having presidents who retire. The Egyptians are desperate for a retired president. You know, they, they talk about this a lot. 7,000 years, nobody's ever retired. Please, can we have one who retires? Countries like <coughs> Libya, where they say to me, when I went to Benghazi in the middle of the fighting, and I met some wonderful people, and a young man who'd been imprisoned by Gaddafi for eight years said to me, it's very simple, we want what you've got. You take democracy and your way of life. It's just your way of life. You don't worry about what the police will do to you, or that your rights will be taken away, or that you'll be imprisoned, or that you can't vote for someone, because you do. That's what we want. We want what you've got. And I think our challenge is to help them get what we've got, but in a way that works for them. So I say to e Egyptians and to President Morsi, I will judge you by what happens to the women. Because in my experience, what happens to the women tells you a lot about what's happening to everybody else. If the women are participating in politics and economics, the women are fulfilling their ambitions and being seen to play a key role in your society. Your society's probably got a lot going for it. In other countries, you have to remember that they look different. They have different faith, they have different backgrounds, they have different desires and different ambitions. But the critical thing is what happens to people? Are their rights respected? Are they entitled to be who they wish to be? Can you build a strong economy? If we can help them do all of that, economics and politics, then that's about the contribution we can make to help them build their nation. But you have to start from the principle it won't look the same as the one you know. The problem from hell in the Middle East, Syria, uh, nobody has a coherent solution. Uh, could you explain uh, to us if there is a basic analysis in the European Union on what the best approach would be? Well, it's a really difficult challenge and the terrible, horrible, daily atrocities that are committed on the people of Syria, uh, just beyond belief, as well as the destruction of this beautiful country with its culture and its history uh, and its economy, which is going to take a lot of nation building at the end of it. I think that the, the challenges fall like this. There is no way, in my view, that somebody who massacres their own people can call themselves a president and stay in power. I don't care who they are and where they are. It's fundamentally that you give up any right, if you ever had any, to call yourself a leader if that's what you do. So the first challenge is to ensure that he leaves office and is appropriately dealt with. The second challenge is then how do you build back to nation building a transitional way in which the country can go forward. And what we've seen in recent times is this coalition from different Syrian organizations, quite a lot of different organizations who are in touch, led by a number of people but particularly by a man called Sheikh Moaz al-Khatib, a Sunni cleric, decent man as far as I can see, who is trying to build this coalition. Uh, at the same time, he's a man who with very quick emotion will break down when he thinks about what's happening to his friends, his family and his country. For us, it's about two things particularly. Backing Mr. Brahimi, he is both the UN and the Arab League's envoy in trying to find a way to break the deadlock of the Security Council and trying to find a way to move forward. And first of all, and he's the first one to say this, the first thing you do is stop people killing each other, to stop the violence first. And then to support what moves can be made if they genuinely are about building a coalition of those who want a better future to try and move this forward.
but as you and I both know, and you know Syria extremely well, far better than I, this is at the moment a conflict that it's hard to predict when it's going to end. And while it continues, thousands of refugees pour across the border, particularly now in Jordan, thousands every day, and I've been to the refugee camps in Jordan. This is a country that can't sustain that number of people coming over. Challenges of Lebanon, where political instability has been there for so long. For Turkey, again, refugees coming to the border and occasionally the challenge of gunfire. And then Iraq, unstable itself, not directly affected, but affected in a region where everyone's attention is focused elsewhere. These four neighbours. So political strategy, Security Council, political strategy, Mr. Brahimi, and the reaching out from the coalition to try and find a way through and put some transitional arrangements in. But I don't see myself much sign of Assad believing that he's about to leave. Mm -hmm. It's a stalemated situation. Uh, one last question on the Middle East before we go to the audience. Uh, the prospect for Israeli-Palestinian talks with the recent elections in Israel, President Obama being re-elected, perhaps having a freer hand to do certain things in that field. Uh, the European attitude thought the current state of play. Well, we have very clear uh, views, two-state solution. Uh, we have set them out very clearly that you need to have territory based on the 67 lines with land swaps because we recognize the situation is not the same as it was. Uh, that you need to have Jerusalem as a capital for both. That you need to work out what you're going to do about all the refugees and have a sensible proposal for that. You need to deal with issues like water. But this is by no means an insolvable problem. In fact, in the grand scheme of things that we all deal with, it's a problem dying for a solution. I think with the new government in Israel, the interesting thing is how broad the coalition that Prime Minister Netanyahu is looking at. And that's of itself quite interesting. And the three things he's put high on his list, a couple of domestic things, of course, and Iran, but the Middle East peace process is absolutely on the list, and that's very, very important. It's partly because members of the coalition that he has will put it high, Sipi Livni, she's a Lapid, and so on. But nonetheless, he's recognized it. For what it's worth, my personal view is that this is a year to do this. For the Israelis to have the security they desperately want and crave and deserve, they need to have secure borders. And to do that, they are going to rely on Arab countries in the region making sure their borders are secure and helping them to keep them secure. They need to solve this small problem in the grand scheme of things in order to develop stronger relationships with some of the Arab countries in the region. And that's possible. They have common cause to make, not least on Iran, with many in the region. And I think the fact that President Obama is going there in March I think the appointment of Secretary Kerry, who's had a long, long passion to try and do something. We have a real strength of opinion and view in the 27 EU member states, good relationships with Israel, strong relationships too with the Arab League, who themselves are very keen to work on a solution and to find ways of working better with Israel. This really is, uh, more than ever, the time to do it. Thank you very much. The floor is now to our Baker Institute students and Bryce students. The floor is yours. Now, don't be shy. This is like some of the classes we teach. There are thousands of questions in your head. There we go. Hi, I'm Jesse. Um, I was wondering what you thought about the situation in Mali and uh, France's involvement there. Um, some people, it, it's, a, it's a topic of debate and it's something that's come, come up in a lot of my courses. So I just was wondering if you had any words about, about that situation. Well, Jesse, it's two or three things. First of all, the French intervention was, as you know, at the request of the Malian government. And this was about terrorists from the north who had decided to move further down, I think, to gain territory that they could then bargain away again because a lot of work was going on in 
what we call the Sahel countries, the four countries, Mali, Mauritania, Niger, Algeria. We have a big Sahel strategy, which included a big training mission for the Malian army to make them more effective in dealing with a combination of terrorists and drug dealers, essentially, and sometimes working together in the north. And so that's what they were doing. So we were in touch with Paris throughout. They decided that they should send troops in. The African Union is now engaged with that. So a couple of things. One is France operating within a European context and operating fast. We don't have a European army to do that. Secondly, the solution for Mali is a much bigger and broader one than simply a military intervention. The political roadmap that we've insisted upon, elections to be organised properly and outreach to the north. The Sahel area, desert, never sees governments doesn't see much of anything really humanitarian needs hunger schools all of the development things you think of are going to be needed in that region if we're going to be able to help and support them and governments are going to have to start reaching out more effectively <coughs> so short-term french intervention that's the ambition but a long-term engagement with mali will be there doing all of the other things for 10 or 20 years is my guess. Yes. Yeah, thank you for being here. First of all, I would like to um, make a statement that I admire you not only for conducting the union policy, but also for doing that while you're building the Department of States of uh, European Union, building the external action service from scratch. And I think that's very hard <coughs> to do in the same time. So my name is Radu Filip. I'm a um, rice alum, and I'm also a EU citizen coming originally from the EU state of Romania. Yeah. My question comes from a different angle than necessarily foreign policy. Um, it's coming from the angle of services towards EU citizens living abroad. I have a, a proud father of a two-month-old daughter. And she's been born here, she's an American citizen, but I would like for her down the road to also have the EU citizenship of, of her father and, and carry with her the European heritage. Right now it's not possible, I need to travel 1,500 miles for the first but closest embassy to even get her birth certificate. In your blueprints for the external action service down the road, do you think that would be possible for my daughter to be able to come to a EU consulate in Houston and just access um, you know, consular services? I'm not talking here about taking citizenship away from the, from, the, from the member states. I'm talking being an agent, putting business processes in place to streamline consular services and reaching more and more EU citizens in the world. Thank you. Well, congratulations on the little girl. That's the most important thing. Um, you know, consular services is one of the really interesting parts of the European Union. First of all, a European citizen can go to any embassy of the European Union for help. And that's something that most European Union citizens don't know, never mind an American audience. But it is one of the things that we, we offer. And there is a, d a long debate about how you develop those in the future so that people can access consular services, especially in countries or parts of countries where you don't have EU embassies or individual member state embassies. All I would say is in this economic climate, I think it will take some time before we see a consular service in this great city of Houston, um, simply because I think it won't get to the top of the wish list fast enough. Be yeah, well, you have to talk to the Romanians about that. I don't have passports. So you're going to have to build up a lot of frequent flyers. And <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so, people question is, do you have, does the EU has honorary consuls the way many countries have? Because I would like to sign up. No, we don't at the moment. Uh, we've thought about doing it in some parts of the world. Um, but when you're building a service from scratch, um, and I described it as kind of flying a plane while you're still building the wings. Yeah. Um, you have to, first of all, build the kind of corporate culture of what it is. And you know that the new service is not just officials that existed in Brussels, but it has got diplomats from every single member state. So you're adding in this mix. So uh, a delegation of the EU in, in, in America is led by a Portuguese person. The deputy is French. There are people from seven or eight different countries all working together. And so that's been the main focus of building the team. Honorary consuls may come, 
um, in the future, but it's partly about when we think we can then expand the service and still keep the corporate culture sufficiently that those who are often operating in a solo way in different parts of the world will be able to do it. Yes, gentlemen there. Uh, first, thank you, Lady Ashton, for sharing your wisdom. You spoke a little about um, the EU's position on the Israeli-Palestinian conflict and what Europe would like to see. But from here, at least, it seems to be mostly America brokering or not brokering a deal between the two sides. So what is Europe's active role in peace agreements? There are different roles played by different countries, and the United States is absolutely crucial to the success of a Middle East peace process. Not just, as is often said, because they, if you like, bring the Israelis. Because actually the Arab world looks very much to the role of the US. But because the US has played such a vital role in supporting the security of Israel, and will continue, in my view, to be a big guarantor of that security. What the European Union brings is we have got strong economic relationships with Israel and with the Arab world because we're neighbors, that in times to come, the relationship with Europe will grow and grow because we're part of the same area. And because we have also got a contribution to make in terms of both soft security and hard security, that we can provide people and we can provide support financially and otherwise. We provide more money to the Palestinian Authority than anybody else by a long way. We give them more money than we give anybody else. It's a billion euros a year to keep the authority running. And that means the institutions that will then become a government if there is a Palestinian state. We support Gaza. I visited Gaza three times which is a pretty horrible place. But all the schools that run there are run with the UN and a huge amount of European money. So we pay a lot and we support very much the efforts. And we work with the US through the quartet, which also involves the UN and Russia, but also bilaterally. And my argument would be, we don't do what you do, but we can do what we do. And so the strength of it is if we do it together. And that's what I think we should do. You talked a little bit earlier on around the US-EU uh, relationship. Certainly within that context at the time when the US is very much focused on domestic issues and perhaps from a trade perspective, uh, the Trans-Pacific Partnership. Could you say a little bit around the future for trade, perhaps a potential future free trade area between the EU and the US? Well, at the moment, as you know, there's quite a lot of discussion going on about whether we could have a stronger economic relationship across the Atlantic that would boost trade and investment. Um, it's complicated because there's a lot of regulation in all of that. I negotiated when I was Trade Commissioner with my dear friend Ron Kirk, who's just stepped down as USTR. Great guy. We did beef and bananas together. <laughs> um, and these were long-running disputes. And I suppose what I think at the moment is there is a massive potential to really make the transatlantic relationship work for our businesses large and small, and for our investors, large and small too. But as well as the technical work, which will be complicated beyond belief, undoubtedly, you also need a really strong political will. And I hope that we'll see that in the next weeks and months ahead, because I think it will be fantastic to do it, and really beneficial. Lady here. Lady Ashton, I was just wondering, um, from your position, in in the wake of the Arab Spring in countries that you mentioned, like Egypt and Libya and Tunisia, what do you see um, expanding in terms of um, women's rights, women's political participation, and whether you see like a solid change coming after the events that happened there, or whether you think the status quo is the same, or what you think on It's very difficult to tell exactly what's going to happen. Um, I've certainly met some of the most extraordinary women who've been on the front line in all the countries going through dramatic change, literally on the front line. Um, some of whom have gone on to become important part of the new administration. Some of whom are very frustrated about what they see as a lack of willingness to engage. In, in 
Egypt, some women said to me after the initial uh, trauma was over that the men expected them to go home. You know, it happens at the end of all traumas that the men expect the women to go home. It happened in the country, I know best, at the end of the Second World War. The women went back into the kitchen, as it were. <coughs> so there's a big challenge to try and make sure that the women are able to stay engaged. We're supporting a lot of women. I'll give you a small example. In Egypt, we've just supported two million women in Egypt to get ID cards. Because without an identity card, you can't open a bank account or get a health clinician to see you. You are your husband, brother, father's property, if you like. So they become very important. They're only two euros each, but they matter. In other countries, like in Libya, I attended the first women's conference not long after the fighting stopped, where 200 women came from all over Libya to make the kind of demands about the role they saw for themselves. And inevitably, and in every country I have ever met, the women are running the NGO world, mm -hmm. especially. So you see the women in all the human rights organizations, through everywhere. I'm hopeful, but it's not certain yet. Uh, and we need to do a lot more with people like UN Women, with Michelle Bachelet, and others to really push this. Hillary Clinton did probably more than anyone. I talked about her spreading a particular kind of magic across the world. It was like being with a rock star for me. <laughs> you know, she took me to the baseball match in Chicago. It was fantastic. They're all looking at her and cheering. It's quite amazing. Um, but she was always, always determined in every visit she did that we would do a lot with women. And we did in Afghanistan, in Iraq, in every country we went to. And I intend to carry on that work but it absolutely relies on everyone being determined to show that one of the consequences of change is that women do well. A final thought, though. When I became a uh, high representative with the longest title in history, I chaired my first Foreign Affairs Council of the 27 foreign ministers of the European Union, and it was all men. And about halfway through it, one of the men, the Finnish foreign minister, said, Cathy, have you realized everybody else in this room is a man? Which I said, it doesn't matter, I'm in charge. <laughs> <laughs> Very good. <laughs> Young lady there. Thank you, Lady Ashton. My name is Sarah. I know this is not a main concern of the EU, but I was wondering what the EU's stance was on the uneasy tension in Cyprus. It is a big concern. It's not, a, it's not an external concern, Sarah, you're right. It's an internal concern. You mean the, the division between the North and the South in Cyprus? You know, one of the most extraordinary things I've done this year has been to go to the Green Line, as it's called, <coughs> which is the line in Nicosia, which separates the North, which is Turkish Cypriot, and the South, which is Greek Cypriot, to, just to give it a... It's not what they would call it, but let me just call it that for ease of understanding. And the UN look after this piece of land, and when I visited it, the UN commander said to me, you'll feel like you've gone into a film set because you leave Nicosia with its bars and cafes and Starbucks and everything else, and you walk into a piece of ground that has stood as a war zone for 30 years. And there it is. You go to an airport that's just overgrown. You see through the kind of old buildings that have got, just like a Hollywood set, they've got creepers growing through them because you can't touch them. You can't knock them down, you can't do anything with them. And you see this uneasy tension that exists between Turkish soldiers who are as close as you are and Cypriots from the south. One of the big challenges we have to face is how do we reunite this island? And how do we find a way through it with our colleagues in Turkey to solve the problem. It's with the UN, who are doing a very good job in trying to work with the different communities. And there are many examples of discussions and uh, groups of people from the north and the south working together. But it does need a big political push, I think. And over these coming months, well, we'll see whether we can approach that. <coughs> For me, it's an internal issue 
but it has, of course, ramifications for the work I do with Turkey, which I do a lot with the Foreign Minister of Turkey and with the Turkish people. And it has a lot to do with my relations with NATO because I'm also a defence minister for Europe. So I spend time with, the, with NATO. I sit as the foreign minister and the defence minister. So I go to more NATO meetings than anybody else. <laughs> Amazing. And in that context, the relationship with NATO, with Turkey as a member and with Cyprus as a member of the EU has its challenges from a political perspective too. So it's a big issue. Yes. Hi, my name's Thierry. Um, I, I'd like to go back to, to your sort of political roots. Uh, the UK has had a tumultuous relationship with, with the EU <laughs> over the years. Um, I'd like to ask you, what do you think the, the UK's role uh, should be in the EU today and in 20 years from now? And uh, on that, what do you think about you know, recent statements made by David Cameron about, uh, about that relationship? Well, the EU really wants the UK to be part of it. I described it as, you know, sorrow uh, at the idea we might leave. Please don't go, was the way I described it to <laughs> the British government. The UK is important in the European Union and has especially been important in the kind of work that I'm involved in. It's not an accident that they chose a Brit to be the first uh, high representative. They wanted to create something which had what they think we have in our DNA, and I'm not sure we do, by the way, which is a kind of diplomacy, pragmatic approach. But Britain's been really important. They've supported enlargement. Romania, Bulgaria, the other countries of Eastern Europe, there was a big drive from Britain, from every political party, to see those countries <coughs> coming into the EU. There's been a big drive from the UK to keep the single market operating and to have strong trade and investment agreements. So it plays a big role. And we, <coughs> in the European Union, want to see that continue. For the Prime Minister, David Cameron, he's made it clear he wants to stay in the EU too. But there are political challenges, as there always are in a domestic circumstance, that I always make a point that there are nine countries who would give a huge amount to be part of the European Union tomorrow. They're knocking on our door saying, please, can we come in? And there are countries within the EU where when you ask in an opinion polling way, people are pretty skeptical about what the EU does. And Britain perhaps is uh, at the forefront of that at the moment. The political challenge is to convince people that it's not just about not fighting each other anymore. Because for the generation, even that I come from, never mind the generation <coughs> you come from, that's history. It's about what we can do together. And my point earlier on about knowing that you can do very little on your own is absolutely true from a UK perspective. We rely, as British people, very much on this relationship with the US. But we've also relied very heavily on our relationship with Europe. And from a US perspective, we're much more valuable as a country and much more relevant as a country if we're part of the European Union. So the Prime Minister, if he is Prime Minister in, after the next election, will hold a referendum and he will campaign to stay in. And I'm married to an opinion pollster, so I can reveal exclusively here <laughs> that I'm pretty confident from the polling that that's exactly what we'll do. <laughs> <laughs> Yes, ma'am. Could you describe in some more detail your actual powers when you open yeah. with, for the French position, press one? <laughs> how much do you have to consult as opposed to how much would you choose to consult with the member nations before you choose a course of action? I describe my role as being part of our leadership and part of that being the chairman. Um, Policy is determined by the Foreign Affairs Council, which meets every month, 27 ministers, chaired by me. I meet the defence ministers and the development ministers too, but we'll stay with the foreign ministers. At which we, we work out our positions on a range of different subjects. Those positions will be instigated by me, 
working closely with the ambassadors from the 27 countries who form what's called the Political and Security Committee. And it's a combination. If it's about Mali, it's more likely that the French will have worked hard to try and put a position forward. If it's on other subjects, it may be coming directly from me and from my services. And we do it by, by presenting a set of conclusions. What should the council agree to? Which we then work through and at the meeting adopt. <coughs> so therefore, that becomes the EU position and if you like, my mandate to operate. And when I speak on the back of those conclusions, I speak for all. I consult a great deal for two reasons. One is because I think that's my job, is to create the policy with the union. And secondly, because I'm not stupid. If I go off and create a policy over here and none of them like it, it won't be very long before I know about it, either directly or through their media. So we need to kind of work together. The good news is they want to do that. The 27 enjoy coming together and developing the policy. And as time has gone on, I'm not the new girl on the block. You know, I'm the eighth longest serving of the people around the table. So most of them now think of me as naturally in this position. It's what they've got used to. There's only a few that I still have to kind of, you know. <laughs> To kind of follow, kind of follow up on that question, what are the challenges then when you have fast, fast uh, changing um, situations when you have that many members of the work with and you know, the policy and fast changing the work situation? I can't find you. Can you stand, 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 up, stand up and say it again? Stand I'm up, so yeah. sorry. When you have that many members, what are the challenges then in fast changing situations when the policy and that kind of there are 27 um, ambassadors I described in the Political and Security Committee, and they can meet at an hour's notice. They're based in Brussels. Their job is to try and develop the plan. So if we have an emergency situation, first of all, I can act. But I will more likely start acting and convene that at the same time. Because often I need the member states to give me their opinion. When you think about the spectrum of countries, each of them has got a special knowledge or relationship or an expertise with some part of the world, either because they sit next door to them, Finland and Russia, or because they've long had relationships, France and Mali, or because they just know a great deal about the country because Portugal, South America. And that means you can use that expertise to really try and develop a strategy that's the best it can possibly be. When we look at issues, we are able to act fast because we're all based in the same place and we can bring everybody together. But we also, and this of course is the, the joy of being in the job for, my God, nearly fourth, it's my fourth year, is you also know what they think half the time. Yeah? You know, you know wh which way they're going to react. Or rather, you know which ones you need to call because the rest will tuck in behind them. You know, if you're, if you're a country that doesn't have a particular view or knowledge, you will look at what France is thinking or Germany is thinking or Italy is thinking. That will be the sort of centre of gravity. And on most issues, we look for the centre of gravity and then we can work with that. How has the global economic crisis sort of affected your role as ambassador? Have you had to make any compromises that you wouldn't have wanted to make or that are unpleasant because of the global situation? Well, I think the economic situation of Europe has been um, a factor in trying to build a new service. I mean, if you could have created the, the most difficult set of circumstances in which to do it, this is probably it. We had uh, real economic challenges and we had our neighbourhood changing dramatically before our eyes, before we'd even got the budget for the service to exist. So that's been, the first year, 18 months, were very, very difficult in trying to do all that. Sometimes global economic factors or factors that affect you make you better with resources. We've had to think very hard about how to use our money well. And that's not a bad thing, ever. But it does limit what you can do. I would like to have opened delegations in some areas faster than I've been able to. 
you know, I've had to open and wanted to open in Burma and in Libya and in South Sudan. But I had to do it with not the real resources I would like to have made that more effective. And of course, as time goes on, when you look at, for example, development spending, all countries are facing challenges about what money they've got, what money they can use, and that's going to have a big impact on what we can do in the world over time. And the next few years are going to be difficult. <coughs> Final comment on that. For many countries too, the global downturn has not been about them, but it's had an effect on them. <coughs> so parts of the Caribbean or Africa, countries beginning to develop their economies have found it very, very tough and therefore have become reliant on us again in a way they would have preferred not to. And so it's, it's really important we get moving now on this economic upturn in order that we can really address all this. But I would have liked an easier economic climate, I confess. <laughs> if I may comment, it's not only Europe, it's also our own country, the United States. I mean, the looming debt we have in the long term, how can you be a, pretend to be a preeminent power if your economic base is shrinking and you cannot project political, economic, social, and military influence overseas. It's a, it's a critical issue for everybody. Yes, ma'am. Uh, yes, ma I wonder if you tell us what you think the future of Afghanistan might be. Well. You have five hours. <laughs> <laughs> the, the first thing is we should not get hooked on 2014. It's really, really important that um, the messages go out as often as possible, that we're not leaving in 2014, that things are going to change, and they're changing already. The Afghan security forces already deal with most of the country now, and that will continue to be the way forward. Because so often you hear this kind of, I'm not saying you're saying this, by the way, but you do hear it a lot, 2014. That's the end of time, as it were. Uh, second thing is we have to stay there for quite a long time in development terms. There's a lot of extraordinary work that's gone on. The number of people who could access primary health care has gone up from 20% to 80% of the population. Lots of people in school, a lot of girls in school. Things have got better for many parts of Afghanistan, but there are still real challenges. And one of the biggest challenges is going to be the elections in 2014 and who replaces Karzai. And I have no idea how that's going to work out at this stage. And whether we're going to see stability continue or whether that's going to be a time of turbulence. Without question, there will be those who will constantly want over these next few years to push at the system and try and use all sorts of means, some of them violent, to bring this country to its knees. And we've got to be prepared to help them prevent that. Good training for them. We do a lot of training for police officers because a lot of the work done to counter terrorism is actually done at police level. It's very important, not done at soldier level. We're going to have to help build the economy. We're going to have to help build in communities the capacity to make sure that all children go to school jobs are created, and there's a future. And we're going to have to let people go home. And by that I mean at the end of conflict, you always end up with some people who've been caught up in the conflict, who've become the bad guys, who need to go home, need to find an investment of their own in their own communities. And that's a kind of reconciliation set of issues that I'm by no means any expert on in Afghanistan, but somehow has got to be done while recognizing that not everybody wants to go home. Some of them want to carry on fighting and they, they need to be dealt with and brought to justice. Final comment is I traveled around Central Asia in November to talk to the various countries around Kyrgyzstan, Tajikistan, Uzbekistan, Kazakhstan, and others around what they saw about Afghanistan. And the good news was how engaged they were in thinking particularly what they could do to try and stabilize the country. And that's going to be essential, as well as, of course, Pakistan and what happens in its relationship with Afghanistan, which kind of goes through different phases. And then India. If India could work out a trade deal with, with Afghanistan, it would solve all of the problems. 
because the, the, the size of the economy of India and what it could do with, with Afghanistan is really big. The problem is Pakistan sits in the middle. <laughs> and so that's going to be a quite interesting opportunity, I think, in the future. For me, our commitment is, I've said, we'll be there for 10 years at least. And I've committed us to that, even though I won't be there to worry about it. <laughs> One last question. Well, I had to do well we have, maybe we'll have two. Go ahead. Mm -hmm. Go ahead. How do you deal with an enemy or an element that literally will stop at nothing and that literally prefers destruction to construction? Well, you have to bring them to justice. Simple as that. And you have to look at what is going on that's creating that. Now, I'm not making excuses. There are no excuses for suicide bombers. There are no excuses for those who wreak havoc on the innocent. No excuse. But in, when you look at these countries and where this is happening, some of the issues we know we can help with. And I'll give you, by giving you a completely different example. The, the piracy that we saw off the coast of Somalia has dropped by 95% in the last three years. And the reason was because the pirates were young boys and young men, some as young as 14, who went to sea with the promise of $10,000 if they were able to hijack the ship, versus $1 a day, maybe, on the land. What's changed is Somalia's going through the kind of transition that really could, could be lasting and where we're beginning to see the growth economically. That's going to make a difference. And the young men know they have a very high chance of being captured and imprisoned now, because we've done a lot to bring that element of justice to the situation. You can change for quite a lot of people who get caught up in it, the possibility that they will become terrorists. The north of Mali, they never see government. We kind of put health clinics up there so they'll actually see the sense that people actually care about them. Terrorists come down into the villages and take the young men and train them and brainwash them and change them. And so far, we can find no record of any young man who's left ever going back. We can change some of this. We can't change it for those who have decided this is the course of action for some warped sense of who they are and what they believe. But we can change it for all of those who get caught up in it. And I think that should be one of the things that we work together on with the US, and really where we should put a huge amount of effort, because frankly, it'll be worth it. Thank you. Excellent. Well, Lady Ashton, all I can say is we're really very honored to have you here, <laughs> and we're very pleased that Secretary Kerry has a telephone number and a contact <laughs> to call <laughs> your. Thank you for being here. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.